and we are recording. And today I'm with Brendan Wood. How are you, Brendan? I'm great. How are you, Sonny? I am well. I'm well. I got to admit, I'm excited about today's call. Um, you know, just from uh, the few interactions we've had, I'm uh, yeah, I'm pumped. So maybe you know, I could level set. I usually um, I usually start with where we kind of connected or where we met. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's more recently, right? I think it was through one of your, your, your it was one through Yeah, exactly. Your, my, my business partner, you actually met him at a Bitcoin at a event uh, in what, Toronto, I think a year or two ago. Yep. Uh, yep. So that's, yep. that's how you and I connected just a few weeks ago. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So we, we met each other recently, um, but uh, as we'll, I guess, kind of get to know later on about you, that you, you did have uh, some exposure to Bitcoin really early on and, and, and all of that, but really more captivated by just you generally and then your kind of your story around passive and the company that you've built here that I think is very, very intriguing. So happy to have you here. Um, so where do you want to get started in terms of your story? Where, where, do you, where does it, I don't know, kind of naturally begin? Yeah, well, I mean, we can, we can start at the beginning, I guess. We can roll way back. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm from the East Coast, Canada. I grew okay. up in Newfoundland, and now I live in New Brunswick. Um, cool. So I was there until I you know, did my whole high school thing. Mm -hmm. And then for university, I moved to um, New Brunswick. And um, gotcha. that was kind of like a big change for me, spent pretty much my whole life on the rock. And this was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to leave, leave the rock and go to a different place. That's, you know, it's, it's the mainland. It's where all the stuff is happening. And like, really that's New Brunswick, but <laughs> it's uh, New Brunswick probably has a bit of a reputation as being like, not a real happening spot, but from my perspective as a kid, it, it seemed like a whole lot more happening than the town I was growing up in. So that's how I ended up here. Okay. Have you ever heard of Fort McMurray? Yes, there's a lot. I mean, <laughs> tons of people I went to school with ended up in Fort Mac. Yeah. I, I probably, uh, you know, had lunch with them uh, when I was working at Syncrude. But I grew up in I grew up in Alberta, and I spent a lot of my childhood in Fort Mac. And uh, I remember when I finally ended up, you know, growing up and working in in the oil fields. I had a lot of uh, a lot of friends that were from your neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So cool. So uh, I guess so. You grew up out east. Um, That's right. I, I went to school like, to do yeah. uh, mechanical engineering. Like very. You cool. know, I was I was kind of torn when I was a kid. What do you, what do you want to be when I grow up? Right. And I always said like I want to be an inventor. You know, like if you ever watched nice. uh, Teddy Ruxpin, right? Like that was one of my favorite shows when I was a dude, kid. Dude, don't get me started. This, <laughs> there was this crazy inventor on the show, like the mad scientist character, right? Yeah, yeah. And he was always building shit. And I'm like, I, that's what I want to do, right? <laughs> I want to be an inventor. And so when I would tell people that, they'd be like, oh, silly boy, people don't invent things anymore. <laughs> right? It's like, no, people don't do that. You know, you can you can get a job doing something else, but why yeah. build? Yeah. And, and so I kind of had that crossed off in my head. It's like, well, mm. I, guess, I guess people just don't do that. All right. And it was only when I was in, uh, in high school that I realized, hold on, there's like an entire like industry or you know like engineering is a thing right i didn't even know what that was until i was like 16 or 17 and that's when i oh, realized really? this is what i really wanted to do all along engineering hmm. and so i went into mechanical engineering because it seemed like the most well-rounded of the engineerings you got to hmm. know a bit of chemistry you got to know a bit of statics you got to know a bit of electrical right and then it all kind of ties together into like general machines so i did that robotics mechatronics and uh that eventually launched me into a software career interesting my for the record my my wife's a mechatronics engineer and she was at amongst the first group of uh, mechatronics engineers i think or the second group ever out of columbia it's really interesting so i have uh, i have a whole thing i love i love robotics i love mechatronics so what did you end up doing did you did you spend much time in that space did you did you or uh, well, like, what did your, I don't know, like, well, what's, I, what's the I, next part of your story, rather? Yeah, I, I sort of fell into it by accident, right? Like, I was always interested in programming, and I almost switched into computer science, like, midway through my degree. And then I took a course in really? computer science and realized it had, like, nothing to do with programming. It was all applied math. And I was like, oh, that's a real letdown. I just wanted the right code. Um, <laughs> I accidentally ended up in a course on C programming as like my first programming course. It was supposed mm. to be MATLAB. And then due to just some random scheduling funniness, I showed up to the course. It had the same like course uh, identifier as the mm. MATLAB version, right? And uh, the professor on the first day says, okay, I just want to make it clear that if any of you are here expecting a course on MATLAB, you're in the wrong place and you had better like get out now and go talk to your academic advisor. So I was just like, oh shit, this is, this is, this is like first day of university, right? <laughs> Wait, where did you go to university? At University of New Brunswick. And you brought, okay, yeah. So, so this was like the very first class I sat down and was like, you did it wrong, get out, right? And I was like, oh no. So I went and talked to my academic advisor and he's like, this is great. You should, you should take C instead of MATLAB. Very few students get the opportunity to learn C instead of MATLAB. Stay in that course. 
And, and so I did, because the alternative would have been like withdrawing from all my other courses and reorganizing everything, right? And C, I fell in love with it. It's just such a beautiful language. I mean, you, you can make an ugly version of C, but when you're writing like, you know, the really crisp, syntactically correct C, um, it, it just reads almost like a music score, you know, it's just so beautifully constructed. So I, I really kind of fell into in love with programming that way and stuck with it throughout my degree and eventually got into Python programming and GPU programming. And GPU programming is how I ended up getting into software as a career. Wait, uh, curious, uh, was that your first exposure to programming or were you kind of a bit of a computer nerd like growing up like uh, many of us here? Like, did I, you, I was, did you I was definitely a computer nerd growing up, but I wasn't, I didn't really do much programming. Um, mm. Apple Script <laughs> was probably the most complicated programming language I, I you know, ever used. And it was pretty basic stuff like, um, you know, getting your computer to respond to like voice commands and stuff, which is really simple from Apple Script. Mm -mm -mm. Cool. Okay. So uh, very interesting. Very interesting. And so you did you end up uh, getting into Mat MATLAB later on or was that I, never I a thing? I picked it up. I picked up MATLAB like, you know, on the side because it's actually a really easy language to pick up, right? Mm -hmm. um, once, especially if you know C, it's like all the same constructs are there. It's just like even easier because you don't need to deal with like pointer arithmetic and all that stuff. So, yeah. you know, I, I kind of picked that up and I got really good at it and I even had a couple jobs doing MATLAB. Um, but eventually I was just like, do I really want to get locked into this proprietary ecosystem where like, as soon as I'm not a student anymore, it's going to cost me like thousands a year for a license. And anyway, that, that's when a friend of mine was like, you should really just look at Python. It does pretty much everything any other language does, would want to do. And it's like a good general purpose language that you can use for just about anything. And so that's how I rolled into it. So interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, stuck around for a master's degree after I finished my bachelor's in robotics or in mm. mechanical engineering, mechatronics, right? Um, so I was working in the robotics lab. And um, because of my background in programming, we, uh, my, my project was related to um, mechanical simulation. So essentially using computers to simulate mechanical systems. And this is like very much applied to robotics, like robot kinematics. And, uh, you know, less, less on like, you know, the more standard type of robots that you might think and more like, like, like not um, mobile robots, but like, you know, serial and parallel manipulators and then applying optimization algorithms to the um, essentially like the, the uh, joint space of the machine so that you can optimize it to like do certain things. You can make it avoid obstacles in one way, or you could, you know, minimize energy use or whatever you want. So it was like kind of like a mesh between optimization and programming and um, robotics. Cool. And, and that kind of rolled into GPU programming because at the time, um, NVIDIA had released CUDA back in around 2008. And that was like the first general purpose GPU um, development environment out there, right? Up until that point, GPUs had only been ever used for graphics. And if you use them for anything other than graphics, that was kind of weird. And so it was pretty clear that everything was becoming massively parallelized, right? Like all of a sudden CPUs were, instead of having a single core, you'd have two cores or three cores or you know, four cores, right? And then GPUs were going from like, you know, maybe eight cores to like a hundred cores and, and up and up and up. And so my research focused on how do you use GPUs effectively to speed up mechanical simulation and tackle like really complex optimization problems on them. And I kind of stumbled into a job that way because uh, it turned out there was a company here in, uh, in Fredericton that was looking for a GPU expert to um, speed up some of their systems. And basically nobody had that experience because it was such a new thing. So uh, it was like my, an acquaintance of my wife, like, you know, she happened to mention in passing that, um, you know, oh, my, my uh, boyfriend does GPUs, right? And he was like, oh, we need a GPU guy. Will he, will he work for us? Will he do it, right? <laughs> and so I ended up working for Radiant 6 and Salesforce. And, uh, you know, once I did that for a few years, I'm like, yeah, this is, you know, I really enjoy programming. I'm just going to keep doing this. And that's kind of the start of the career. And, and what year are we in now? We're in 20. So that I was mean... like 20, 2011 is when I, when I first started working for Salesforce. And that was, um, if we want to tie it back into Bitcoin. Like I was aware of Bitcoin at the time. I wasn't like super into it, but um, I was like aware that it was a thing. And I had like mined a few and was, you know, kind of generally like, okay, this seems like an interesting thing. You know, I'll keep an eye on it. Right. But not, uh, super sold on any long-term potential. It's more like kind of a fun, quirky thing to look at. 
Interesting. And that just kind of, you don't remember exactly how it came into your radar? Was it just... Uh, uh, I think I heard about it on Hacker News. So I think huh. there was a Hacker News post in 2010. That was the first time I heard of it. And at the okay. time, like, I didn't really <laughs> dig into it in a deep way. I was like, oh, it's one another one of these, like, e-gold scams, you know? It's like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody, somebody's just, you know, trying to trying to make a mint, right? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, it, was, it was only after, like, it popped up a few more times, and I, I kind of, like, read into the discussions. and was like, okay, there's something a little bit different about this. It's not, like bits in a database right hmm. it's, it's like a it's a decentralized system that's agreed upon by a network of of computers that are like <laughs> that are securing this network it's it's like a distributed database and that was where i really got interested in it because it kind of tied in really closely to the um, types of research i was doing at the university and you know parallel computing and that sort of stuff and very cool so, yeah mm-hmm, it, was, mm-hmm. it was probably like mid 2011 that i really started um getting into it is early 2011 i tried to mine some on my cpu and <laughs> it's like uh i wish i wish i had mined more it was probably worth about a dollar a bitcoin at the time and i could mine uh one bitcoin a day using my cpu on my macbook pro except that it would just sound like a jet engine and run it like a, you know 100 degrees 24 7 and it was unusable for any other tasks when it was doing this right so i let it run for like three days and then was like i kind of need a computer you know like, I gotta turn that <laughs> off i don't like burning my wrists every time i touch it and so i'd mined like i don't know three or four bitcoin at that point and then <laughs> stopped <laughs> interesting interesting that, that and, and you know a lot of people kind of don't even care maybe or get that but i think it's super fascinating like how um you know how in in the early days you could uh you know like you said whip up a laptop and mine a bit of bitcoin whereas you know today there are like these massive like warehouses full of like asics and like mm-hmm. you know it's, it's far more it's just different um it, have you have you have you read into that much like just like that like that and how it's kind of analogous to, i guess digging gold and it just gets yeah, harder totally. over time <laughs> well i i, I kind of got back into mining a little bit later so oh yeah um, as i got deeper into my uh, like master's thesis on gpus and mechanical simulation i actually had access to like really beefy gpu rigs yeah um, we, we had like these uh, three or four thousand dollar rigs that had the top of the line gaming gpus and like you know three of them all kind of hooked up and so this was right around the very early days when uh, GPU miners were like a thing. We're a but thing. A they were, thing. yeah, like people I were like, I think, I think you could parallelize this, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so I actually used that for mining um, coins for a while. But but again, like it, it boiled down to like, it didn't seem like it was making a lot of money. And oh, because it was like, what? Bitcoin was what at that time? Like, well, yeah, by the time I got this rig, Bitcoin was probably around like, I don't know, 10 bucks a coin or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so I'd mine for a day on one of these things and I might make like $2. Right. And in the meantime, I can't use my research machine because <laughs> it's mining crypto. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and and it, it was always like kind of that like trade off of like, well, it seems like it didn't really do much. Is it really worth $2 to like, just like not have this? beautiful machine to do my work on no i mean i'm not yeah yeah anyway that's, <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Like it was always yeah, yeah. A thing. And, and so even now that like, apparently ethereum is like really hot to mine with a gpu these days um hmm. i look at it i'm kind of like well i mean it might be but on the other hand like pretty much all the value you get out of it is from like appreciation of the price anyway right so like is it really worth mining i don't know <laughs> mm, just buy it or something yeah yeah if you believe okay interesting interesting okay so i guess what's what what next so you you start uh that's very interesting though like the fact that that was kind of your lens into bitcoin right like through gpus and just your interest in in distributed networks it seems like well okay so what uh and then and then had the, by this time were you kind of like sold that you weren't going to go down the road of like mechatronics mechanical engineering uh and even sounds like robotics right to some extent like you'd fall uh, in i'm, I'm still software. not sold on that it's my like mm. I, hobby? I, 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 it's my <laughs> hobby it's my first love whatever you want to call it right? nice um yeah. i i really like the idea of like giving physical embodiment to software you know like that's that's the cool thing uh the problem is that it's really hard to do and if it's not something that you're spending like all day every day on like it's hard to kind of push the boundaries and do interesting things Brennan, i don't know if i told you have i have i have you ever heard of a company called kwanzer i have not no what do they do they're actually a company that, believe it or not, I worked for, for, uh, I think, I want to say almost nine years. Uh, they're based out of Markham. They, um, they're a robotics company. <laughs> they build uh, robots for, I don't know, maybe two, 3,000 of the top uh, robotics labs around the world. Uh, 
U of T, Stanford, like customized robots, like whatever dude, everything from order. little simple motors that you can use to teach a second or third year electrical engineering class to a six degree of freedom, haptic robotic KUKA device that has MATLAB and Simulag integrated. You just move a few circle squares and voila, your robot's doing what your controller was designed to do in real time type of gig. Really, really fascinating stuff. Um, and through that job, in fact, I had a chance to, you know, kind of get like a first hand look at, at what's what's happening. So I'm, I have a love for it as well. In fact, I, I married someone who, like I said, is a mechatronics engineer too. So we're we're always playing around with uh, my, my, my two little girls. They they bought this. We got them uh, this thing called an owly. I think it's like an owl, a robotic owl that flies. <laughs> it's got like a little quad rotor built into it and sensors and uh, okay, so but just curious, since we're on the robotics topic, do you do you do you do you tinker much? Like uh, like just on a personal, like do you build things? Do you do you like get I do, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm more into like like woodworking and carpentry these days cool. than robotics, but occasionally I'll like you know crack something open and, and do some electrical wiring. Yeah, um I've got like a workshop in my basement with you know all the all the tools I need to build things. So I'll you know build furniture. I mean I built a bunkhouse last year, a nice like 16 by 14 bunkhouse. Um, you know, tree houses, custom play structures, Sweet. outdoor kitchens for the kids, you know, basically whatever I feel like working on. Cool, cool. Okay, so I'm I'm fascinated by that. But okay, so what what happens next then in terms of so you're now I don't know you said you're are you still at the university or have you moved on? I was kind of like a little bit of both for a while. Um, I almost didn't get my master's degree because I had spent uh, basically uh, I started my master's in 2010. In 2011, I got a job. Um, like basically the job I wanted to get out of the master's, right? So like at that point I was like, well, I basically got everything I wanted in yeah. this program. Why should I bother sticking around and writing a thesis? You know, right? So I kind of went part time for two years and then you know two years in i was kind of like ah, you know should i should I, should I just like hunker down and do this thesis or like should i just say screw it and stop paying my like you know <laughs> fees every semester right and um so i kind of like i had a moment of clarity one day and was just kind of like you know it's probably not that much effort to just like tie this all together i had a few papers under my belt at that point right and it was like you know it, because it was a um it was a research-based master's, but it wasn't like one that was, uh, you know, aiming towards a PhD or getting rolled into a PhD. So like the complexity of the project is not crazy. If you write a few papers, you can usually take them and like just kind of tie them together into a coherent story and make a thesis out of it, right? Hmm. So I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do that. I was at the point where it was kind of like holding me back to some extent because um, I had a job offer with a company in San Francisco. Yeah. And the reason I didn't take it is because I wanted to finish this degree first, but I wasn't even sure I was going to finish it. So it was kind of like, oh, what's the point, right? Hmm. So basically, I, I just like sat down and pulled all-nighters for two weeks, finished up the thesis, submitted it, got her done with, and hmm. then kind of continued on from there and then and then I quit my job at Salesforce shortly after that and moved on somewhere else oh and then you so, quit your job at Salesforce. and what were you doing at Salesforce GPU stuff GPU stuff yeah so interesting um, okay so I was working I guess at they run servers. six yeah yeah, yeah. they run a lot of servers as you can imagine course, yeah um this this particular wing was for their uh their marketing cloud so um uh like social media monitoring and stuff was what the particular branch that I was at was doing so it's like monitoring the Twitter fire hose and crawling the web and analyzing absolutely everything against this massive database of keywords and search expressions, and then being able to, you know, populate results from that. And the, the key thing about Radiant 6 is that they were the most real time social media monitoring out there. Like, you know, there were other companies that did it, but, you know, they're crawling the web, they might not pick the results up for a few days, um, you know. Whereas Radiant 6 was like, well, they had like live Twitter fire hose and we would be pushing results to customers within seconds of when a tweet was made. And that was all well and good, except that um, the computational complexity of the keyword matching was increasing, like technically not exponentially, but like at a really crazy weight, right? Where, um, you know, they double the number of customers and the computational load on their servers goes up by a factor of four. Right, which is like at that point, you're you know at some point you're going to hit a wall when you your servers just cost more than you're billing your customers for. So, um, they hired me to make their keyword matching engine uh, more efficient, and so that's that's what I worked on. Interesting, cool. So you left Salesforce, and then I guess where do you where do you go from there? Uh, I went to a company called Priceonomics. Um, they're a Y Combinator company based in San Francisco. They're still around, but um, they're you know it's not it didn't turn into like a smashing success or anything like that. Um, I'm proud of the stuff we built there, but you know, it never really, you know, hit the the rocket fuel like, like some other startups do. 
one of my favorite things is uh, success matters. Failure is inconsequential. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> In fact, I have a company that I work for called Buttercoin. I interviewed uh, a couple guys from there recently as well on the show. And uh, we'd gone through YC and, you know, it didn't work out. But uh, boy, do we have some great stories to tell. <laughs> well, exactly. For me, it was like, I, I kind of look at it as like a learning experience, right? Like, yeah. I spent I spent five years at Prisonomics and I learned a ton. Like, mm. I basically, you know, we basically re-implemented their entire stack from scratch several times. We did several hmm. products from the ground up. So I basically learned how to build a product from scratch, how to do full stack, you know, from top to bottom, the whole thing, how to manage a team and do it. And now that I'm on to my own company, Passive, um, our stack is almost identical to what Priceonomics ran because that's what I know. It's what works really well. And it's super easy for me to spin up a new product based on the stack that I know, right? So I kind of look at it as like, it's almost like a, a degree program that I got paid to do as far as I'm concerned. It's good. Cool. Oh, cool. So, okay, what happens then, I guess? So I guess that doesn't work out, but then is then you roll into Passive and then what's kind of the, I guess, the story behind Passive? Yeah, so I I'd started to um, to invest, uh, like, you know, save for retirement, that sort of thing. Back when I got my first job with Salesforce, they had like a really generous, um, uh, you know, contribution matching plan where you'd put a hundred bucks in and they'd match your hundred bucks up to a certain amount, right? So it's basically free money. You want to take advantage of it. And so I started doing that and saved up quite a bit of money that way. Um, except that... Uh, all the, like, they were with a, a plan provider, right? And the plan provider only supported mutual funds and they were terrible mutual funds, you know? I knew enough at the time to know that, like, I don't want some money manager, like, picking stocks and having fun with my money. What I want is, like, just a broadly diversified index fund, which is, like, the simplest and the cheapest and, like, lots of good things. Uh, yeah. you want. So I went to put my money in an index fund, a mutual fund, and the fees on it were almost 2%. Right. And at the time, I didn't really think much of it. I was kind of like, oh, well, 2% this doesn't seem like that much. And it was only like after I had my money in there for a year that I was like, I wonder how this plays out 30 years from now. And I kind of did some math and realized that, oh, my God, this is going to cost me several hundred thousand dollars if I leave my money here. And they're not doing anything that that complicated. So I started investing it myself and uh, basically opened a brokerage account and started started. Um, doing Canadian couch potato style investing where you're buying these, you know, broadly diversified ETFs and then keeping them balanced so that you're, you have like a, your risk tolerance as a ratio of equity to bonds, that sort of thing. So I was doing that for a few years and it was easy at first, but it got more and more tedious as my accounts grew and like my wife added an account and then I had a kid and we had the kid added to, and he had his own education savings account. And so at the point in around 2016, I had six accounts, several of them were maxed out. And um, they weren't all following the exact same target. They had like, you know, they were being invested for different purposes. So I had like different versions of my spreadsheet that I would have to go in and like do the calculations on. And then every time I wanted to do that, I have to go like double check my account balances and copy and paste everything into the spreadsheet and then check all my positions, make sure that's valid, right? And it's not that it was hard. It's just that it was like amazingly tedious, you know? It's, it's one of these things where you feel like you're just doing this this uh, busy work for the sake of busy work and you're not actually mm. contributing anything of value. Right. And so at that point I kind of like, was like all right, I either got to pay somebody to do this or I got to like figure out a way to automate it because uh, you know, I can't be spending, you know, two or three hours a month managing this stuff. It's just pointless. So um, I happened to have my money at quest trade and that was fortuitous. Like, it's not like um, I didn't, I didn't open an account at quest trade thinking I might do this, but it turned out that quest trade has an open API. And as a software developer, I was like, well, you know, they allow you to write personal apps. I'm just going to like go write a Python script that automates all this shit. So I spent one weekend writing a Python script that did this. And then I would like every time I wanted to do it, like, you know, once or twice a month, I would just run this script and <laughs> all done, right? Super easy. So that was kind of like the problem that I had and how I solved it. Like I wrote my own code. And uh, as I talked to people about this, I found that a lot of people had that problem. Like any, pretty much anybody who's managing their own investments in a brokerage account in that way has that problem in that brokerage accounts are not designed to manage a portfolio. They're designed to buy and sell individual stocks or you know do options trading or whatever, right? But they're, they're at like kind of this low level functionality. And as soon as you want to do something higher level at the portfolio level, they just fall apart and they're not very helpful for that. So that's when I realized, you know what? There's an opportunity here. API, like my broker has an API. I see that other brokers are starting to have APIs. They're probably all going to have APIs at some point. 
and there's probably room for a company here that will be the portfolio service provider that runs on top of all these things. They all provide the same basic functionality at like a low level instruction set of buying and selling individual shares. And I kind of looked at that and was like, that's kind of like the instruction set of, of a computer, of a CPU, right? You get these low level instructions and then you build these abstractions on top of it to build applications that do actually useful things. And so that, that's how I started Passive. And the goal of Passive is to essentially be the portfolio management layer on top of brokerage accounts. It's the software for your brokerage account. That is insane. Hey, um, you know, Brendan, I was talking at the beginning of this is that like one of my goals of this show is to, is to get people to build, right? To build whatever it is, right? Whatever. And, and I think that the one thing I wanted to kind of highlight there was is that you scratched your own itch. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and I think that's... I don't know. People always ask, well, how do you, how do you start a business? You know, how do you do that? I think the worst thing you can do is try and do some sort of like market study and try and figure out, you know, oh, I, I heard baby boomers are going to be a great, you know, people to sell to. It's like, no, just, just solve your own problem. Like solve yeah, your own problem. Your own so problem. I love if that. You don't have your own problem. Find a way to get a problem. <laughs> <laughs> make it up, make it up. Yeah. Give yourself a problem and solve it. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Okay. So, 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 okay. I love that. So by the way, it's, I mean, normally I kind of do this at the end, but uh, passive.com without an E, right? So passive.com right, yeah. is the website. Passive. And is it, it's just for Canadian uh, people right now, right? Or Canadians, right? No, no, rather. we, we operate in a lot hmm. of different places in the world. Yeah. So um, where do you guys operate? The most of our customers are in Canada. That's true. But uh, we support brokers in the United States, like um, interactive brokers, like TD Ameritrade, Alpaca, Tradeer. So those are kind of like the main ones we support outside of Canada, but we're always adding more. And so our next focus is actually the Indian market. Um, so we haven't, you know, that's, we're not ready to like make any announcements of, you know, it's live or anything, uh, but that's what we're focusing on next. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, India is a, is a big market. <laughs> a lot of people live there. You know, it's a great place. So I think that's wonderful. And, and I think the Indian market could definitely use something like this. And it's just like, whenever you, whenever I talk, think about passive, it just seems like, such an obvious thing, right? But uh, it's surprising. So is this kind of like what robo, this whole like term that people use robo advisory, is it kind of like it's, build it's your like own? It's kind of like that, like yeah. DIY? So I guess robotics has like found its way back into my life right? somehow, right? Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> I, I kind of, we kind of, uh, a good way to describe it is like a do-it-yourself <laughs> robo advisor. So DIY put your robo money advisor. In, in like Betterment mm. or, you know, Wealth Simple or whoever, right? But they'll put you in like a, a bucket. They'll ask you a few questions. They'll say, hey, you belong in this bucket and then they will invest your money in that way and there's not a lot of room for flexibility whereas right. with passive you have complete control over how your investments operate um, you can build um, you know an esg portfolio if you want right you can like have no money in fossil fuels and it's fairly straightforward to do if you want to do it that way got it interesting 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 and, um, and, and and so Passive itself then, first of all, is it a mobile app as well, you said, or is it just a website? It's, it's just a website. It is like a responsive website, so it'll work fine. So it looks nice on your website. Can, I mean, yeah. on your uh, on your phone. Um, and and um, and people, so so just to kind of like describe it. So it's essentially like a, like a layer that sits on top of all the brokerage platforms and you're able to, you know, do fancy things like balancing your portfolio and, and you know, things that people do when they do financial management, you're able to do those things. And, and there you believe in execute trades, buy and sell, right? Yeah. The executing trades is is a huge thing. Cause like, Mm -hmm. you know, even, even after I built the first version of my script, right. uh, The very first version didn't have trade support built in. Right. So Mm. it would basically spit out a list of trades that I would need to make to balance my account. And then I go log into my, my broker and like manually place three or four orders. Right. And fine. Except that like that's slow, it's tedious, it's prone to human error. Like mm. there's a lot of reasons why you don't want to do that. And so uh, I basically baked in trading integrations as quick as we could into the, into the product. And now it's a single click. Like, we basically show you the, the list of trades. Say, do you want to make these? And you say, yes. And five seconds later, you know, Bob's your uncle. You're good. Lovely. Lovely. And, and again, you know, I, I know we touched on like Bitcoin a little bit, um, but like the, the, just to focus more on the building side of it. Right. Um, like, I'm just curious, what did that look like those early days? Did you, did you just like whip up some sort of like MVP somewhere and then, That's, you know, basically it was, it, it kind of like, it took a lot longer than you might think. Right. And mm. uh, you know, I'm coming to understand this is pretty common for how like products are developed <laughs> like you know they don't spring into existence fully formed they are grown to some extent right so it started as a shell script that i a python script right that you I, mentioned. I wrote for myself yeah um then i built a very basic website around like once a few people had told me oh I, i'd like to use that but i don't want to run python i don't know how to code right it's like i can't just give you my script that's not helpful right so i built a little website that was called rebalancer and 
that's basically all it did is it would let you like type in your positions and like you say, here's your positions and here's your target. And then it would just run a little bit of math and say, here are the trades you need to make. And like, that was the entire thing. And there, it didn't even require, it didn't even let you create an account. It was just like a, a site that you would go to and do this and nobody used it. <laughs> like, now I did, I also didn't, you know, go on like a big marketing campaign or anything. Right. But like it was promoted on Reddit a few times and like nobody used it. And I kind of like questioned like, well, maybe this isn't so much of a problem I'm solving if nobody wants to use it. Hmm. But I kept at it for a while and thought about it some more and realized, you know, like this isn't really that much better than a spreadsheet. Like the, the way that I built the site, because you have to type in your, your uh, portfolio every time you want to use it and so on. And I, I guess like at that point it, it was, I was running based off of market data. It wasn't directly linked to a brokerage account or anything other than hmm. like mine, my own personal one when I was running my own script. Right. Um, but I realized that like, okay, well, there's this developer thing with, with quest trade, instead of just like building this for my account, I can, if I like take it a bit further and put more effort into it, I can like give, let people create accounts here. I can let them link their own brokerage accounts and then they don't have to do this manual entry. They can just set up their target once. And then- Oh, I see your first one was you had to literally manually type in, like I got this yeah. much of this doc and oh, okay, I got you, yeah. I got you. The only thing that wasn't manual well, why the original you, version yeah, was it would pull, yeah. pull the prices automatically and that sort of stuff, right? So like <sighs> you wouldn't have to be, chasing prices we'd make sure it was always perfectly updated right gotcha and so that, that's what it was it was kind of crappy right like and and nobody wanted to use it and i you know that's that was one of these moments where i was like did, did i actually solve a problem maybe i didn't maybe it's not good enough maybe it needs accounts but people use it if it has accounts i use mine because i don't have to manually enter it and i probably wouldn't use it if i had to type it in every time right so i kind of like had these discussions with myself and eventually said, you know what? Yeah, I'll do that. I'll go, I'll spend like another few months working on this and then we'll launch it and we'll just like see if people use it. And if they don't use it, then there you go. Experiment solved, right? Interesting. Yeah. And that's another, that's another thing I think they think is very interesting is, is that I think maybe engineers do this a lot too, but we, we are, we tend to look at businesses and opportunities as like experiments so that, that you don't get personal about it. I find like one thing that, you know, it tends to happen is you just like, uh, you get attached to like some idea and it's like, it's just yeah, an experiment. Like becomes you, right? Yeah. It becomes it, you. When it fails, you feel the failure. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's cool. Um, so what, what, what's next? And I guess, I mean, in terms of the passive story, how do you finally start finding product market fit as they say, or whatever, you know, like how you start getting clients <laughs> yeah well we, we launched it on reddit um and reddit. the first launch was actually like really bad like <laughs> but we we don't even like we don't even mark that like on a calendar or anything or like when people ask when you started like we don't talk about this for the most part because it was so bad but the so when i had like a basic version with user accounts and stuff that's when um i found a business partner to work on it with me um and we our skill sets complement each other he's more on the business side i'm more on the tech side and uh you know, I figured, all right, well, you know, we'll balance each other out. Hmm. So when I had the basic prototype working, that's when he came on board and was like, I get this, this is cool, let's do it. And that's hmm. awesome. And it was in uh, April 2017 that we launched it for the first time on Reddit. Interesting. And people started signing up and creating accounts and then being like, well, let me connect my, my account. Okay. I was like, oh, I mean, it works fine for me. Why doesn't it work for you? And it's because we were using a personal app ID as like the client ID for this. So Questrade had it locked. So it was only going to work with my account because the app was created on my account. <gasps> okay. <laughs> and, so, and so the only way around that was to become like an API partner. But like, you know, we had submitted the form to do that. And like, we weren't really getting much like any responses from them. And mm. you know, like, what the hell are we going to do? So at this point, I was kind of pissed. I was like, man, this is supposed to work and it didn't work. And there's no documentation as to why it didn't work. So I was like, not happy that I had spent months building this thing only for it to be like it's not gonna work <laughs> so i created like a like because they weren't you know responding to their their uh their the standard api form right i basically just like called up quest rate support and was like get me in touch with somebody on the api team and they're like we don't know what that is <laughs> so i escalated and escalated and escalated until i found one guy at quest rate who actually knew what i was talking about and he was like oh yeah we can get you set up with that no problem and so he got me a, uh, like, you know, there was some legal documentation to get filled out and everything. But uh, within a few weeks, we had an actual uh, client ID and we put that in the app and we got a few people to test it. 
and it worked and then we relaunched and we got a few hundred people using it uh, like right, right at the gate pretty much at that point and that's when we realized cool like you know if you can launch this thing and get a couple hundred signups just like that that's that's a solid indicator that this is solving somebody's problem and would you remember what your tagline was off the bat like what, what was your hook or whatever like what <laughs> do you remember mm. like it was still called rebalancer at the time so rebalancer yeah so it was like just, it. just rebalance your portfolio you know really easy Fair. way of rebalancing Fair. your portfolio set a target and we will let you know when or we weren't even letting you know at the time we were just like whenever you want to rebalance come into passive and you know we'll give you the calculations we'll give you the trade set as a former financial advisor as well this is like definitely uh very very interesting and fascinating and you can really go so many places with that right if you if you become people's like home for for like where they manage their their wealth you know you can do so many things cool okay so interesting so i guess wow a few hundred that's exciting you've been working on it you brought you made the invisible into something visible um and then what how do you how do you i don't know go from there well it didn't really and, well, by the way are you are you just on this now or are you also working elsewhere I, was, I still have my full-time job this was yeah this is all just on the side like gig 2018 in 2017 so. yeah 2018 okay yeah, so we we incorporated shortly after that. We caught some regulatory attention right shortly after we wah, launched. Wah, wah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a few <laughs> lawyers heard about what we were doing, and they're like, "That sounds an awful lot like advice. Are you qualified to give advice?" <laughs> and the answer is no. We're not qualified to give advice. They're like, mm "Hmm, yes, you should probably be talking to the regulatory bodies now." So we did that, and you know. That's a whole other story, which which actually turned out really well in the end. But it started okay. off very scary because we just had like regulators breathing down our neck and speaking to us in legalese, which we didn't really have a solid understanding of and no money to pay lawyers to explain to us. Right. Hmm. And, but basically what they told us after like a brief conversation was, yes, you were giving advice. No, you were not allowed to do that. Shut it down. <laughs> just like shit that sucks we, you know I mean, at that point we weren't too heavily invested right but we're just okay. like damn it like this is not what we need but um we we did actually end up hiring a lawyer at that at that point and kind of explained it to them they're like oh yeah i'm pretty sure that that's not advice when you explain it like that so let's let's instead just have a conversation with them and see if we can convince them to that it's not right and so that's what we did. So we like had a few meetings with them and we went and met them in St. John, New Brunswick. This was like the local New Brunswick regulatory body, right? Um, and explained to them what we were doing. And once we had explained it to them, they're like, oh, this is kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, but like a little bit better. I was like, yes, that's exactly what it is. It's just like, you know, you can download rebalancing spreadsheets on the web and type in your stuff and it'll chew, spit out answers for you, right? This is the same sort of thing, except that it has better UX than an Excel spreadsheet. And once we show them kind of like how the features map between like a spreadsheet version of this and our app and how it's all completely self-directed and we're not telling people what to invest in, they tell us what they want to invest in. And we just do the math to figure out here are the steps you need to take to follow your plan, right? That, that made it very clear to them and uh, we got the decision reversed. And that's another, you know, uh, one of the big things. I mean, I talk more about Bitcoin businesses, but I mean, dealing in finance, like that is one of the things you got to lawyer up. <laughs> yeah you do <laughs> especially if you're an engineer and like an you have no idea at this, at this point like we you know we have a solid enough understanding of the regulatory frameworks that we don't need to ask a lawyer every time we do something right but we still keep in touch with the regulators and then whenever we're doing something like a you know whenever we have like like oh, i want to build this feature but i can see how they might have a problem with that let's have a conversation with them and mm. you know make sure it's all good right so we we go through that process like maybe once or twice a year with new features that we're working on right right fascinating okay Okay, so I guess well that's that's a that I mean I can definitely uh, relate to that one, but um, you know you just gotta I guess you know uh, like lean into it and just make it happen. So so cool. So then what what happens after that? Well, Bitcoin went through the roof shortly yeah. after that, and and, and you I, had I some. Did you hold some? Some Bitcoin. Hello. Yeah. Hello, talk some. to me. So when I mined some, I also <laughs> bought some and I traded for some and I performed services for Smart some. Man. Like this is way back man. in the day. Way back in the day. Okay. It, it and you kept of, your wallet because most people. Well, I, I mean, uh, I, did, I did keep my wallet for sure because like it was, you know, a few hundred bucks back in the day. And like it was enough that it was like, I don't really want to, I don't want to lose that. Right. Well, you know, but, most people don't like they have so many stories, whether it's, ah, I lost it. I gave the computer away. Especially well, there, there were yeah. some that were lost over the years. I can tell you about that. But for the most yeah. part, it was, you know, it's pretty well cool. kept track. 
track of. Uh, I, I really like, you know, I did buy some back in the day, but I bought some because it was like a technological novelty. It was like, what can, you know, supposedly I can use this to buy stuff on the internet and people will ship things to me. Cool. Right. <laughs> so I got a few hundred bucks worth and was like, I'm just going to buy some stuff on the internet. And then I realized nobody's actually selling anything for Bitcoin back in 2011. I mean, it, some things you can get, but like it's very, very small market presence for that sort of thing. So pretty much the only thing I ever bought was like Molvad VPN services. And that's like the only thing I ever spent it on up until it became worth a fair bit of money. And then I started doing things like buying, uh, you know, sheets on overstock.com and like ordering food in San Francisco with it. And like that, that's when it got started getting really interesting because it was just like, I have this wallet full of funny money that never cost me anything to get. And people are delivering food in exchange for it. That's marvelous. <laughs> okay. Uh Interesting. So, so you so did. I, okay. Yeah. So I had this and like, if I had held on to as much as I had back in the early days, if I'd never sold anything, kept it, it would probably be worth like 20 or 30 million today. Right. Crazy. But it's, it's like, it's not like it was a one-time decision to be like, I'm going to hold it or I'm going to sell it. Right. It's more like a continuous thing where every single day you'd kind of think, Oh, should I buy this with Bitcoin or not? Oh, the price is high enough. I'm surely I would spend, you know, a fraction of a Bitcoin on this or that. Right. And, you know, you make that decision compounded like every day, compounded over eight years and uh, you, you end up with fewer Bitcoin than you had originally. In fact, a lot fewer. But either way, I, I it, when it really went through the roof in like late 2017, early 2018, um, that's that's when I actually made a fair bit on it. And that's when I realized, you know what, like. I don't need my old job anymore. I can, I can like quit my job and I can fund this company with, with Bitcoin basically and use it to build an app for the traditional finance world. And I thought that was kind of a funny irony as well. <laughs> that is insane. That is insane. So that's crazy. Okay. So, okay. So continue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm listening. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I always wanted to include crypto in it, but at the time, like we, I mean, we just had too much other stuff going on with like, you know, the app needed so many improvements and we were trying to like get licensing deals with brokers and mm. like running marketing campaigns to get people using it. And like, we just didn't have time to like go bake crypto into it, but it was always like kind of a vision of mine because that's actually what I was doing personally. Um, when I say Bitcoin, like, yeah, I held Bitcoin, but I held a bunch of everything else too. I approached it from like an index type perspective because I was like, well, you know, you know, Bitcoin's going to stick around, but like there's other interesting projects as well. Mm. And they're different enough that I could see them maybe sticking around. So like Ethereum is a good example of that, right? Like it's, it's a fundamentally different project to Bitcoin. It has different goals. It has like a level of programmability, which is, you know, like not really apparent in Bitcoin. Uh, it, you know, it has like a lot of interesting things. It's like, okay, this is different enough that you think it could stick around, right? And there's other ones like uh, Monero or, um, or Zcash, right? Um, they have the anonymity, which is like, that's, that's a killer feature. And not many other coins have that sort of thing. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that might be worth something in the long run. Right. So I basically, um, my whole approach to like indexing cryptos was look at cryptos that are distinctly different from each other and put like a tiny bit into each and sort of do like a, almost a weighted market cap approach, but I buy, I biased it towards the smaller coins as well, just because if you were doing a straight up like market cap weighting, you'd end up with almost nothing in anything but Bitcoin, you know? <laughs> so. Right, right. But you can, okay, I see what you're saying. So you use like Excel files in the background to kind of conjure up that, but you're, I guess, hinting at the fact that maybe someday, you know, people might be able to do that within the passive environment, perhaps That's maybe right, if yeah. they're lucky. I mean, that, that, uh, yeah, like it's, <laughs> it's what we can do with stock. So why can't we do it with crypto? I see Got them you. like- you know, they're not exactly the same thing, but um, they're very much aligned in a lot of different ways. They share a lot of characteristics and more and more people are looking at uh, cryptocurrencies as, in as investments. So like they're going to be a part of people's portfolios and it just makes sense to bring them together. Cool. Cool. Well, I I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling that man. Cause yeah, I would also say that one of my, <laughs> Is I'm a Bitcoiner. I consider myself a Bitcoin maximalist or whatever, this and that. Um, but I'm also like, you know, a free market guy. I'm an ideas guy. I, I, and I grew up in, I mean, I'm, I've been in Toronto mostly for the last 20 years. And I was at a front row seat with Ethereum. 
But I always felt like if there was, you know, kind of an easier way for people to get exposure to some of these other assets without having to go through the whole, you know, song and dance and trying to figure everything out. Like if it was just like seamless and there's a way to like kind of balance it and it that would just fit a market need. So I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, entrepreneurs think about that. Um, okay, what uh, what next, I guess? Is there anything else you wanted to share on the passive front? I mean, uh, yeah, I thought that was, I mean, that, you know, that's, yeah, passive yeah, that's been like most my of focus it. for the last few years. I didn't really have Got a it. lot to say about anything other than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no. I love that. I life, mean, yeah. I just want to make sure we I don't, uh, you know. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so it, I guess let's move on to the third, you know, kind of whatever question. So I was telling you is, is that what is one thing that you believe to be true now having kind of, you know, seen this Bitcoin thing for, for quite some time um, that you think most others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? Um. Most others in Bitcoin would probably be like Bitcoin well, maybe what you just said. Tour. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say maybe it, what you just said, that, the Ethereum. What, yeah, I was kind of like <laughs> getting into that. But like, I, you know, as much as I like Bitcoin, it's the thing that started it all. It is, you know, the king of the coins as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. Um, it's not the only coin and it cannot possibly cover all possible use cases of crypto, right? Hmm. And so as new coins come up with like actually novel, interesting, useful um use cases hmm. uh, i see them having a place in the market as well and like you know whether or not anyone's ever like the, the flippening is going to happen i have no idea you know yeah yeah that's, nor do you care less about I guess. that and more about like you know there's going to be a plethora of these cryptocurrencies out there and you know there's going to be a lot of them and <laughs> they're going to coexist Yep. Yeah. And might as well have some exposure or whatever. Okay. Uh, I love it. Okay. I think that that's perfect. Okay. Um, quick question, not quick question, but uh, just a question around AI. Is that something, uh, and maybe let me pre-qualify that with saying like, uh, like I love like the narrow, you know, bands of AI where like you have Google and Tesla and like the heart surgery robot and this and that, right. Those are super cool. But just to kind of make you know, leave, leave people off on a more saucier note, like, do you think much? Have you ever read the, the Singularity is Near by, um, you know, Robert Kurzweil? Uh, Robert Kurzweil is it? Yep. Raymond Kurzweil, and yeah, um, this whole idea that the singularity is coming, and that we're like twenty, maybe thirty years away from this moment where, um, you know, what I'm saying, like, we're like a thousand dollar computer da, 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 can do everything that a human can, and like this point at this point in time where computing and, and robotics, uh, you know, really um, evolved to the stage where everything can be done, you know, just robotics through robotics and AI and all of that. And do you think about each other that? And then like, is that, do you think it's even like a potential reality or what do you think happens with, uh, uh, I, with I AI think, and all of this? I think we're going to see some radical changes, mm. uh, like probably over the course of our lifetimes, hopefully we live long enough to see it. Um, I, I don't, I personally don't think we're going to see anything quite like a singularity. Like it's, it seems from what I've read of like uh, Kurzweil stuff on the singularity, it seems predicated on like exponential growth and the fact that like, you know, once you hit the knee of the exponential, there's no going back. And that is the case for a lot of things, but in the physical world, exponentials live for sort of like limited periods of time. Um, nothing is exponential forever because it would consume all creation, right? So most things in the world that look exponential are only exponential at the beginning. And they, they're actually more of like a logistic curve, like an S curve that kind of like starts like this and kind of, you know, flattens off at some point, right? So it, it looks exponential when you're at this part of it. And it probably it can be modeled very closely with an exponential. But eventually you you saturate whatever it is that's feeding it. And that's it, right? So... I mean that that's kind of like the the, the core thing I think is as to why. But do you like, think we've seen that? That like do you think given no, the, I don't the horizon think, I don't think we're of science and the top you... yet? No, I think we have a long ways to go. Uh, but I don't think it's um, I, yeah, I, I, a singularity. I think is like a term that implies like there's this defined moment in time where like everything is different after this, and maybe that's the development of like strong AI or something, right? But but even mm. then. Like, is it possible for strong AI to be so ridiculously intelligent that it's basically a god and it's able to, like, hack physical laws to do what it wants? Um, I think probably not. I think that there are, like, constraints in terms of how things operate and limitations in, like, how smart something could be, right? Maybe it can think 10 times as fast as you, but it might not make 10 times better decisions, right? So, yeah. And Brendan, have you played with open AI? Uh, I have not, no. I recently got access to it. It's pretty interesting. 
it's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, I think I agree with you. Like I read Kaifu's book recently to it. I mean, it seems like there were still about four or five kind of like major uh, breakthroughs before, uh, you know, I think deep learning was probably one of them, but you need like, we're still a ways away before something like, you know, the singularity probably comes to fruition. Um, but I got to admit, like, Cars it's driving really themselves cool, yeah. is pretty freaking cool. I, I, we're, we're definitely in like a bit <laughs> like, of a, an AI renaissance at the moment, right? And I think a lot of it's driven by this deep learning. Right? And I kind of have mixed thoughts about that, mixed, mixed um, opinions on it. Because like on the one hand, like it's super cool and it's absolutely mind boggling what's been possible with deep learning just in the last couple of years. Like you look at the things that have happened, like, you know, it was thought maybe 10 years ago that like, you know, a computer would never be able to beat a human at Go, right? Which... Like at the time you could have said, well, they said the same thing about chess and that happened, right? But chess, like Go yeah. is just so much more complex, right? But sure enough, like, you know, the Deep Minds team worked on it for what, a year or two and just like destroyed every world champion. And now it's like, yeah, I thought, let's forget about that now, right? And it seems like they're doing this to mm. every problem. The, uh, the protein folding problem is like, probably one of the most important ones that I've seen because that's something that's been like an unsolved problem in biology for, like 50 years or so and the only way of of addressing it up until now has been like just throw ridiculous amounts of computing power on it now it's just kind of like oh no we have this like deep learning model that uh figures it out as you know to the same level of precision as our experiments can figure it out right it's like don't even bother doing experiments anymore because this this model is so good at what it does it's amazing but on the other hand, like, yeah. despite all these really impressive things, uh, the concern I have about about deep learning is that like it's very hard to get an understanding of why an AI makes a decision it does or why it works the way it does, right? Um, because it's it's you know a neural network is such a complicated thing. You can't. It's not working at the level of like rational thoughts on the inside. It's working at a different level. And so if you try to like work backwards and say, well, okay, it decided that this was the case. Well, why did it decide that? What did it think it was actually doing? And those sorts of answers are very hard to tease out of it. So as amazing as the progress is, I'm kind of skeptical that it'll ever like become, you know, general AI type, type levels where like it can do literally anything. It, yeah. it, it seems like they, they train a model to do like one thing really, really well. And it does that one thing really, really well, but it breaks in every case. That's like not a part of its training set, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Hey, I just, uh, you know, to, um, I, I, I think, yeah, I agree with you on a lot of that stuff. Um, just switch gears a bit. Um, you know, like um, I wanted to ask you a question around this. I, I know it sounds a bit different from what we just talked about, but like, I think it kind of ties in in the sense that if, I guess even if you look at like, let's say autonomous cars, there are a lot of people who drive for a living, mm -hmm. right? So whether we get to that point or not that we were talking about, um, it is foreseeable that at the current rate of acceleration that we could see massive job loss. And, and you don't even need to wait for automation or robotics. I mean, technically with COVID that's kind of happened. So what, what the question I'm kind of getting to is, is like, there's this, and, and by the way, I'm saying that I'll preface it with saying, I'm not like, you know, co communist or socialist. I just think it's an interesting idea of, um, of like universal basic income, right? Cause I, I do think about like people and like humanity and like, like, you know, if let's say, you know, whether it's like autonomy, uh, auton automation or I mean, the robotics or AI or COVID or something else. Um, yeah. I mean, do you, do you think that universal basic income is something that, like, you know, now even people like Elon Musk, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that it could ever be given birth to from the private sector? Like not necessarily private by sector. like, hmm. or not the private sector, but by like, by, not governments by not by like bitcoin like bitcoin's not private i guess you could say right but like by people like can it could it be solved by ones and zeros at a much more kind of granular level where at least you know what i mean like i think if you even got like five or ten bucks in the hands of most people they wouldn't be like dying of starvation like we're not talking like oh making everyone rich without working like they're gonna be lazy no it's like what if we could just get like a little bit of money in the hands of everybody um but i don't know i don't know have you ever thought about that or is that way too uh, convoluted I've definitely thought about, like basic income and stuff and I, like honestly i think basic income is like the 
required result for a stable world as automation increases and automation hmm. will increase. And I think it's actually a good thing. You know, like you talk about job loss, like suppose we get autonomous cars. Well, okay. Taxi drivers are completely out of a job, right? Hmm. It's going to be a lot of people who lose their way of life. Right. And that's tragic, but the world as a whole is not less wealthy than they were prior. Right. It's like, you know, if you have, say you're making pasta, right? And like you're rolling it out by hand and you're doing it by hand and it takes a lot of work to make the pasta. And at the end of it, you're, you're, you've got your pasta wealth from making it, right? Are you less well off because you got a machine to help you do it in you know 10% of the time? No, if anything, you're wealthier because now you have all those extra time to do things with, right? So like that example scaled up massively is like the problem that the world's going to face is that like we're going to have the same level of like material wealth and convenience in the world from automation except we're going to have more time on our hands as as a whole right the problem is that the wealth created by these technologies is by default going to end up in the hands of very few and the very many they're going to going to have problems right um so that's obviously a huge issue and I think the only way to solve it is like a more equitable redistribution of that kind of wealth and automation. And I think it's guaranteed to happen to some extent because if it doesn't, then there's going to be wars. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, you, yeah. You get enough like, uh, you know, 20 somethings sitting around where like an economic destitution where they have like no ability to actually earn for themselves and they're going to get bored and they're going to take up arms and there's going to be big problems. Right. And so mm -hmm. to some extent it's a problem that like will address itself, but that's a poor way to address it. You don't want a war to have to be the way to address it. It'd be better to get in front of it and, and realize that like, you know, income inequality is going through the roof because of automation and tech companies. So maybe we need to think about better ways of redistributing that. And, and never before <laughs> have people, questioned really the you know the level of um kind of dominance of these tech companies right like i mean you think about it it's literally like five or, or six companies and i would say even a year or two ago it was kind of like super sexy to be working at one of them i saw something uh, i saw a tweet yesterday someone was like it's cringe to be working at fang <laughs> I was like, what? Okay, I guess, because, you know, everybody's on them, right? Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, like, how much pressure it is. Like, just as one example, um, Brendan, I don't know if you follow uh, Jack Dorsey on Twitter. I don't. But, no, in fact, um, I'm like, I'm not on Twitter. You're not on Twitter? I, I, oh, man. I've, I've I, never understood. Yeah. I heard when Twitter launched it. I was like, this is weird. I don't even want a blog. Why would I want a micro blog? <laughs> oh, dude. Tw no, Twitter is a free, instant, global messaging system. Mm -hmm. So why would you not want to have uh, the ability to click a button and have anybody and everybody on earth ha be able to access that idea? I, I, I think that's cool. Um, I guess my thing is that like, uh, I don't put much stuff out there personally. Like, you know, I just don't feel a drive to go out there and like send messages to the fair entire enough. world. And so it's never something that it's like kind of clicked with me. Right. It's not enough, to say that it, that it shouldn't exist or that no, 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 it's no, no. not useful, but yeah, oh, no, no, I hear you. I, hear. I, I don't no, even no, have a smartphone. Right. I'm like, I, I don't like the distractions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but brother, I love that, man. I, I, I read, uh, what's it called? Deep work, all these books, right. Recently, Cal Newport, and I got deleted all the social media apps off my phone. It's like been the best is ever, but Oh, Twitter, man. It's the one that keeps just finding its way back into my phone. It's mm -hmm. so addicting. But what I was going to say, and I, uh, and then that, by the way, that's another probably vodcast podcast conversation. Um, what I was going to say though, however, is that um, you might've heard, right? Like uh, the most powerful man in the world, supposedly whoever that was a month ago was deplatformed. He was taken yes. off of Twitter. Wild, isn't it? And forget the what you think of Trump, whether you like him or not. Okay, well, like just it, put that aside because that's like triggered. Yeah. That triggers people. Okay, I don't even want to get there. But just the fact that I think we could all universally agree, at least for as long as I lived on planet Earth, traditionally, if you ask anybody like who's the most powerful person on planet Earth, they'd be like, it's the person who holds that position. Mm -hmm. That person, while still in office, was deplatformed, and so Jack Dorsey went on a Twitter thread and said look i i didn't i don't look forward to, to doing that obviously like imagine how much heat you know he must be under right now like 75 million people voted for the guy and so so i guess and then he goes on to say that look we're working on things like blue sky and this is why i believe in bitcoin because you know platforms like this should be more like distributed like they should be on something like bitcoin anyway so 
where am I going with all this? I think we're at a very, very interesting and important point in time where potentially, potentially, maybe even 10 years out, you look back and you go, ha, ha, I remember that Google thing. Ha, 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 I remember that Apple thing. Like potentially where like maybe something comes about where hardware and software and all of it it embodies this like open source. Have you ever heard of Pine 64, yes. for example? Mm -hmm. Like stuff like that, like start marrying themselves with Bitcoin and Twitter and all of it, like Amazon, all of it should be like kind of not publicly owned by guys with guns. I'm not talking about like government right now. I'm talking about like open source. I'm talking about like a movement that is like got nothing to do with politics. It's just a way that serves. And in a long-term way where imagine if, like the some and this even saying this makes me feel kind of cringy, but like what if right a portion of like the profits generated from the automation and robotics could be fed back to you know a Ubi system where everybody whether you're a billionaire or you're a guy on the street you get like you know a couple pennies or something you know a couple dollars like I don't know again I. I'm so against like, you know, taking money from people with force and giving it to others, but I'm, I'm a big proponent of like helping people and like doing it in a way where we use tech and systematically where we look at things from a high level. And like I said, I, I feel like a renaissance is coming, but it can't be the way it is today where five dudes control the whole world and all the data and everything we're going to feed to this AI is just, you know what I mean? It's like it's siloed in two I, governments I and like, it, ah, totally, yeah. sorry, I'm kind of, it's, wow, it's, going off on a rant. It's a fundamental <laughs> structural problem with tech, I think, that like yeah. these economies of scale lead to like, you know, essentially power law distributions in terms of like wealth and platform sizes. And you end up with like very, you know, it's wealth inequality embodied in a slightly different way, right? Uh, and it, it's a problem. So like, yeah, put aside what anybody thinks of Trump. I think it's terrifying that, um, he, what what happened to Trump like last week? The fact that he was deplatformed so quickly like that's that's a concerning thing. I don't care if he's Trump. I don't care if he's like Rosa Parks or like whoever, right? But like mm -hmm. the fact that that can happen so quickly and just by getting on the wrong side of um, you know a few companies, um, kind of scary, you know. It's kind it's of, kind of scary. Wonder, like okay, they did it this time. What might you know? Maybe they decide to use a little more aggressively next time, right? Yeah, <laughs> man. A lot of funny business out there. Um, but like I said, you know, you can always count on uh, code. You can always count on building craft, building shit with wood, ones and zeros. That's what it's all about. Uh, okay, so what is, uh, where do people, uh, you know, once again, like the website for your company, your, I guess you're not on Twitter, but if there is any blog or somewhere where you kind of, you know, share a bit of your consciousness where, where do people you know learn more about you brendan this has been a fascinating conversation by the way thanks for yeah, putting up with me <laughs> uh yeah so my my company site is passive.com so it's p-a-s-s-i-v.com there's no e um it was like a domain that was easier to get i love it <laughs> no, it's a beautiful I, I actually name. <laughs> tie back to um uh, passive is the german word for passive and uh, I spent a year in Germany and speak German and like that's kind of you know, like, yeah, even if you didn't that that's a great story I love it I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not so much on uh, like, you know, public social media. I am on Facebook, mm. but you know, I don't just get friended with people that often. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, you know, um, there you go. Passive does have a Twitter account. Um, yeah. Cool. Sounds good, man. We'll keep up the great work. Uh, any, any, I guess, uh, last words or we did we cover uh, a lot of ground there? We did definitely, but uh, yeah. Anything else you want to share with the people out there or maybe anything you'd want to share with yourself from like 10 years ago. <laughs> Don't tell Bitcoin. Don't, don't, sell, don't Bitcoin. tell Bitcoin. Lovely. Beautiful end. We can stop it there. <laughs> okay. Sound, sound good, dude. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this, but stick around for like just a few seconds.